Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to the second lecture on uh, images, imaginations and cultures. This lecture is titled History of Visual Culture. Um, before I start this lecture, uh, let me clarify that in this lecture, I am not going to do a chronological, a historical sort of development in terms of years and decades of the development of visual culture. Instead, what I will focus more on is the critical growth, the evolution of visual culture and its various components over the decades. Um, so this uh, lecture is going to be more thematic than chronological um, to look at the historical growth and evolution of uh, visual culture. So before we um, start talking about the historical um, growth and um, the birth and growth of visual culture, um, one thing to keep in mind is again, how do we understand visual culture? What is the definitional, operational definition that we are going to use um, for visual culture? Now that is going to be explored throughout uh, the lecture and uh, in the future lectures also. Um, but just to give a brief background that um, the idea of uh, visual culture is uh, not very recent, but uh, we do see that uh, you know a lot of academic dialogue, a lot of um, academic scholarship is invested currently in discussing visual culture. So, we do see that the history of visual culture as we understand it um, has its roots in the enlightenment movement, um, in the various changing global orders, um, in, in the uh, watershed moments of uh, industrial revolution, the French revolution, um, colonialism. We do see this prolonged history of changing global order, changing world orders impacting what we understand to be visual culture. However, um, the question is then why has the interest in visual culture and its history increased in recent years? Um, what, what is it that's going on now that suddenly we see a burst of scholarship, we do see uh, a lot of academic dialogue happening um, in and around visual cultures. So one thing that we see is that um, around the late 1980s, um, although it has its roots as early as 1940s, 1950s, um, we do see around the 1980s there is an, or an emergence of an organized area of inquiry um, known as visual culture, visual culture as an academic field of inquiry we do see around uh, the 1980s. And this field um, started to look at or continued to look at in more um, scholarly manner um, in all things that is visual. So whether we are looking at images or any sort of images, whether it's photographs, postcards, whatever is the form of an image or artwork, um, you know, all things that is visual is being looked at, is being invested um, within this discipline. And we also see that you know this is emerging as an institutional pattern that uh, we have organized curriculum around the questions of visual culture um, and the advent of the study of um, you know films in more academic terms um, have also played key roles um, in historical writing and thinking in um, the current age that we understand to be the digital age. So. Um, we do see that when we talk of visual uh, culture, we are also investing in talking a lot about films um, in, which are integrated into curricula of colleges, universities, departments. Um, 
and much of this dialogue around visual culture and the history of visual culture also uh, is being contributed from an emerging arm of this uh, discipline um, in the form of film and history as an integrated form of approach to understand uh, the evolution of visual cultures. Um, so in a sense, we see that the growth, the development of visual culture where we are today, um, the state of the art, is responding to a more general trend in academia and this is coming from questions of interdisciplinarity. So this is the crux that we are going to explore today looking at the history of visual culture that we are looking at this uh, evolution of a body of discipline, body of academic inquiry um, that is that has its roots um, in fundamental social structures, social world orders, and um, which is being informed by interdisciplinary academic dialogue um, that has been going on for the past um, uh, several decades. So let me start with um, a question that I uh, also talked about um, in in my first lecture is the idea of visual images. Uh, so visual images comprise a very significant part of visual culture. And visual images, um, this is a definition we also explored in the first lecture. The images, visual images constitute how science is to be constructed, organized, legitimated, and distinguished from non-science. So what we are really looking at is this organized body of knowledge that we are understanding to be visual culture um, also brings with it uh, the idea of a scientific uh, sort of knowledge production. So science was seen to develop through primary human sense of visual observation and anything that interferes with the requirement to establish the facts in our mind's eye is presumed to be unscientific and be rejected. So what, in a sense here, it means that, you know, in order to achieve a scientific production of knowledge, there has to be an orchestrated sort of methodology to arrive at that production of knowledge. So in a basic sense, when we look at an image, when we think of an image, um, an image means a picture, whether the referent is present as an object or in the mind. So we explore in the first lecture, we explore the various uh, definitions or the forms that image can be in. And so, um, you know, if we are exploring using um, you know, our basic senses that, you know, it can be a range, um, you know, from a you know, photograph, a picture, an object, or an idea in the mind. At the same time, a picture in the sense of a sign that resembles a picture is of something, cannot really be in the mind as a moment's reflection will. So, so the other part of a picture is also the content that you know the object content that the picture is of something and this of something you know goes a long way also to define how the idea of visual culture what we call um, you know what we understand to be visual culture has also evolved um, over the decades. So some opening thoughts that uh, we need to consider um, when we talk of visual culture is that visual culture is uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. Now I don't want to use the two terms as synonyms to each other because they are very different in their meanings. So when I say visual culture is multidisciplinary, I acknowledge that the disciplinary boundaries are somewhat maintained and it is being informed by um, you know, the academic dialogue scholarship from various disciplines and, you know, they're converging at a particular point, transgressing those boundaries, disciplinary boundaries, and informing how we understand 
the, the evolution of visual culture. But when I say visual culture can be interdisciplinary also, I'm, I'm also suggesting that in that case, the, the boundaries, the academic boundaries, the disciplinary boundaries are a little more blurry in that case. And because of that blurriness, um, the, the amalgamation, the mixing of information, the mixing of the knowledge systems from various disciplines is a little different than it would be for a multidisciplinary form of an approach. So it matters for us uh, what lens you are using to actually look at visual culture and how it has evolved uh, historically, how it has evolved over uh, the decades. So it can be multidisciplinary, it can be interdisciplinary, and we do see that um, a visual, visual culture is deeply influenced um, and impacted by the evolution of uh, areas of inquiry or disciplines um, like art history, humanities, um, sciences, basic sciences and social sciences. And we also see um, you know, areas such as advertising, landscapes, buildings, photographs, Movies, paintings, and apparel, fashion, clothing, uh, you know, have their own uh, contribution to the evolution sustenance of visual culture. So as you can imagine, the scope of visual culture since its, uh, you know, birth development has been um, expanding. The aperture through which we look at uh, visual culture is also expanding, can be a var varied um, varied forms of apertures that we use to look at visual culture. Um, and uh, it, is, it is really important for us to acknowledge um, what sort of, uh, you know, lens we are using to approach the understanding and development of visual culture. The second uh, idea um, here that we need to explore is um, that visual culture is also a vehicle to communicate culture and you know when we look at something when we when we when we look at um, you know a picture a photograph a postcard an image an artwork um, an object you know we there is some sort of a cultural exchange that goes on behind the scene either implicitly or explicitly that communicates some form of culture. So communicating culture through visual means it has been one of the uh, you know, fundamental uh, functions that visual culture um, has been uh, performing. And we do see that the production, reception, intention, as well as economical, social, and ideological aspects of any sort of visual means, uh, you know, if you have any particular um, idea in mind or if you are thinking of any particular image or if you're thinking of any particular object in your mind or if you're thinking of any particular um, fashion, any particular lifestyle, for example, in your mind, um, you know, I also urge you to think what sort of culture is being communicated through that exchange of visual means. So, the idea of producing, the idea of receiving, the idea of, you know, what is the intent of that image, that visual mean, as well as economic, social, and ideological aspects that go and inform, uh, you know, the, this, this exchange of cultural um, communication through visual means. And finally, um, the idea that um, I explored in my previous uh, slide also is the questions of knowledge production, power negotiation relationship between the viewer and the viewed. And this is possibly, um, you, know, you know, the most important point here to make that, you know, in the end as an academic dialogue within visual culture, um, and looking from a sociological uh, sort of perspective, a social science driven perspective, um, you know, what are the types of knowledge production that we are looking at? What is it that, why does it matter whether we are looking at an artwork, whether we are looking at an image, whether we are looking at a photograph, um, 
you know, what, why does it matter or how does it matter that it impacts a sort of a knowledge production? And this question links with the previous point also that we are talking about communicating culture. So how you communicate culture, you know, forms a basis, forms a fundamental, um, you know, platform here. And in doing that, of course, we cannot overlook the question of power negotiation. That the very moment we talked about, com uh, you know, cultural attributes in the first lecture, and we talked about um, the idea of power and agency. We talked about the um, idea that when people uh, or actors um, enact certain um, actions, you know, um, or not, whether they do it uh, purposefully or whether they are able to do it. So the questions of agency becomes important here. And so what sort of power negotiations um, happen in, in case of that communication of uh, visual culture? And finally, uh, the point here is, um, what are the questions around the relationship between the viewer and the viewed? So, you know, who is viewing, you know, your audience? versus what you are viewing. So if you're viewing an object or a photograph or an artwork, so the relationship between the viewer and the viewed is of utmost importance here. And I will talk a little more about that, um, uh, you know, in, in my next uh, slides. Um, you know, how does that relationship also, um, you know, construct, morph, and, uh, you know, inflect uh, sort of cultural practices. So um, before proceeding any further, I would like you to keep in mind these um, points about visual culture that, um, you know, it can be the idea of visual culture as it has, you know, evolved historically can be viewed through the lens of either multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity, um, you know, acknowledging uh, disciplinary orientations, disciplinary boundaries, and how they have in their own way influenced the birth of visual culture as an area of inquiry or a discipline, however you choose to define it. Um, the second point that you need to keep in mind is that, you know, that visual means visual culture forms a vehicle, uh, you know, a means for communicating culture. So, you know, it is a very important vehicle through which culture is communicated, negotiated, impacted, and evolved. So, uh, you know, what the nature of that vehicle would be or the purpose or the agenda of that vehicle would be um, is, is contextual. And the third point that you need to keep in mind is, um, you know, what sort of knowledge production uh, are we getting to um, in understanding this evolution of, um, you know, visual culture and keeping in mind, of course, uh, you know, questions of power, how is power negotiated? How is the viewer and the viewed negotiating as an audience and, you know, uh, the viewed? Um, negotiating their, um, you know, you know, power dynamics through this um, vehicle. So, um, some of the fundamental issues of visual cultural studies, um, you know, borrowing from that area, and their interrelationship between the image and cultural moments and processes. Talk about, um, you know, this this viewer and the viewed dynamic, um, the image, you know, whatever the form of the image is, and, you know, the cultural context, the cultural process that this image is a part of. So, when we actually speak of visual cultures, um, we are also talking about the complex interaction between a cultural order of things that you know, so culture is a, a complicated whole. And we talked about the attributes of culture in the first lecture. So we are talking about this complex interaction between a cultural order of things, the generating, sustaining, and rendering visible of images. So what is it that is making the image visible? 
and the creation of the spectator. So, the spectator is the one who is actually looking at the image. So, this whole process of visual culture that it is it is a complex, not just an interaction between the image, the viewer and the viewed, but it is also creating the nature of the spectator through this cultural order of things, through a complicated network of cultural processes um, that is giving birth to the type of a spectator who is actually viewing that um, image. So, at this point, you know, scholars have argued uh, also that it is important to recognize that images do not simply exist. So, when you look at an image, um, you know, it's not that the image is just there. They must be made visible. So, to see something and to watch something or to notice something, you know, are very different actions. So, when you're looking at an image, um, you know, that image that you're looking at is not not there just because it's not there because you know it is, exists that image has a purpose that image has an agenda and the image has been made visible by certain dynamics so this making an image visible um, you know the spectator the viewer also has a critical uh, role to play this um, this making of this visible of the image is also creating the spectator. So, when we talk of visual image, when we talk of, um, you know, how that is, uh, you know, embedded within a complicated cultural network, we are also talking about the, the type of spectator, the type of viewer that it is also giving um, birth to. So, it is how images uh, then come to exist and significantly how they come to be seen as meaningful and the bearers of meaning. So, when we attach symbolic meanings to any particular image, we are able to attach that meaning because the spectatorship, the spectator believes in that symbolic uh, meaning uh, attached to the image. So, it is therefore important that you know we understand the symbiotic relationship between the viewer and the viewed um, in order to understand the journey of visual culture you know how it has evolved um, you know through history um, and 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 therefore uh, you know how it has also uh, morphed uh, how it has influenced the nature of the spectator. It has given birth to the idea of the spectator because an image, if an image does not have a viewer, the image would probably be meaningless. It is only when, you know, we start attaching symbolic meanings to images uh, in whatever form they are in that they hold, uh, you know, sort of a cultural um, relevance for us. So, uh, the other thing to note here is that, um, you know, this, this image and viewership, of course, is not a unidirectional sort of a relationship. And, you know, images uh, being used to respond to certain cultural issues and concerns, that is true. But there is also another form of relationship. And um, this sort of relationship is, if you, if you can imagine, it is flowing in the opposite direction and this is the opposite direction where it is the way in which images shape cultural process. So, I am talking about two dynamics here. I am talking about first the relationship between the image and the spectator that is you know the image creating the nature of the spectator and I am talking about another dynamic here where the image is also shaping cultural processes that you know um, uh, that that you know the the network that the image is embedded in that network is also getting influenced by uh, the the image and so um, you know it is very difficult to talk about each of these components in isolation so when i talk of an image i cannot just talk about the image or when I talk about an expectator, when I talk about a viewer's experience, 
I cannot just talk about that without talking about the image and the cultural process it is embedded in. So we are really looking at uh, you know complicated sort of a network where uh, we are trying to understand the relationship between the image, the spectator, and the cultural processes that they are all embedded in, and uh, and. And, you know, it may sound impossible to map out this relationship, but this relationship is sort of inevitable um, and, you know, they are built up over time and space. And so this is another concept that, uh, you know, we talked about in the uh, first lecture that, um, you know, the question of time, the question of evolution of, uh, you know, uh, the idea of an image through space and time. Um, and uh, you know how it has uh, you know moved through groups and individuals and social orders, etc. Um, you know they they become either relevant or they become irrelevant um, across history. And so um, you know when we are looking at this visual um, uh, sort of um, you know platform, you know how it has developed over. Um, the years, um, you know, it is imperative that we look at how they have, how, you know, images have influenced cultural uh, processes, cultural moments, and in turn also they have influenced spectators and the, uh, you know, the spectatorship in turn have influenced um, the, the growth of visual culture. So on that note, uh, I will now talk a little bit about uh, spectatorship that uh, you know that we want to build on uh, because um, that you know as you will see scholarship has invested uh, you know a lot of uh, um, em emphasis a lot of uh, dialogues on the role of spectatorship the role of um, individuals the role of groups um, you know being informed being products of their cultural processes and spectatorship uh, you know in a way again it's a two-way uh, dialogue between image and spectatorship um, is of uh, crucial importance to understand how um, the evolution of visual cultures over time and through space um, you know happen. So the idea of spectatorship um, you know is an idea that the relationship of the image and culture is far more than merely a system of representing orders and ideologies. So when we say that you know an image has a spectatorship, um, you know we are not just saying that you know it is it is just a product of um, you know orders and ideologies, um, but we are also looking at um, you know more you know embedded vast complex uh, set of agendas and relationships. So we do see that visual culture um, denotes the complexities of image and culture and you know it helps us um, making an image culturally significant. And the, the way that an image is made culturally significant um, is the key component, the role of the spectator. So how does an image become uh, you know, culturally significant? It has to be through a vehicle and that vehicle in this case is the spectator. And it is also important that um, you know, to note that the spectator is also not static. Right? So the nature of spectatorship is also dynamic. The nature of uh, spectatorship is also changing. And so with the nature of, uh, with the changing nature of spectatorship, the, the changing nature of meanings attached to images um, would also speak to the evolving nature of visual cultures. So what is happening is that the spectator um, in this case, is becoming an agent of change. So a spectator is an agency of the image as well of the culture. So you know the spectator is acting as an agent for the evolution of what we understand to be visual culture 
an evolution of what we understand to be um, culturally significant, culturally relevant images. And, um, you know, the, the, and one thing for sure is that the spectator, you know, how, you know, however big or small that spectatorship is, um, you know, it is always located within a range of forces, within a range of social forces. So, uh, you know, the spectatorship is not beyond society. The spectator is located very much within the dynamics of society and also, um, you know, determined by the relevance of that image. So, we do see that, uh, you know, the three elements that you see on the screen, um, image, culture and spectatorship, um, you know, they shape each other in a system of reciprocity. So, they are symbiotic, they inform each other, they inflect each other, they change each other and the changing nature of visual culture um, actually captures this dynamism, captures this dynamic nature of uh, relationship that is happening between the image, um, culture and spectatorship. So, um, moving on with the idea of uh, the spectator and the visual culture, um, I'm investing some time to talk about the spectator um, in the evolution of the visual culture because um, this is uh, probably, um, you know, a very dynamic if not the most dynamic element um, in, in the uh, study of visual culture. And once we capture uh, the, the uh, you know, dynamism of spectator, spectatorship, um, you know, would, you know, the historical evolution of visual culture be more meaningful for us. Um, so, when we talk about uh, the spectator and uh, the visual culture, um, you know, when we think of an image and its place within a visual culture, it is often in terms of a static representation that we think of, you know, such as, um, you know, photographs, such as painting, such as sketch, drawing, etc. So, um, you know, when we are talking of an image, the first thing probably that would come to our mind is that it's static in nature, it's not moving, right? So, a photograph, um, you know, would be static, a postcard would be static, um, a drawing would be static. Um, and uh, we do see the advent of other forms of images such as um, cinematic television um, and, you know, they are usually typified in the form of moving images, the idea of movies, um, you know, coming from moving images. And so, but they're still images, right? So, moving images are still images and they are connected but separate existence of the image. So, if you, if you um, follow how a film is made, so it is a set of images that is actually uh, making up that film, making up that moving image. Um, and we do see that, um, you know, architecture, you know, you know, what we see around us, buildings, houses, um, you know, forms of architecture, um, you know, also present us with fragmented and varying types of visual cultures. And, um, you know, in fact, um, if you, if you look at history, the advent of any particular age, quote unquote age, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, historically Roman age, Gothic um, age, um, you know, medieval age, modern age, however you want to talk about it, um, one of the first indicators of this paradigm shift, one of the first indicators that, you know, we are no longer in X age, but in Y age, etc., is indicated by the changing nature of architecture. So, if you look around and, and see an architecture, if you visit a place of historical importance and look at the architecture and, you know, it will speak to you in different way than if you go to, you know, a 21st century, um, you know, CBD, Central Business District and see, you know, high rise all around you. So, architecture in a way is also a very important part of 
uh, visual culture that is communicating, uh, you know, how visual cultures have evolved through um, decades. So, for example, um, in the first um, uh, lecture, I talked about the idea of space. And, um, you know, so if we look at the changing nature of spaces, I will deal with spaces um, also in my future lectures. Um, but um, if you look at visual culture and, for example, uh, you know, heterogeneous uh, spaces within cities, for example, and we do see that, um, you know, different types of buildings in a given city gives us a sense of, uh, you know, um, uh, history, give us a sense of historical evolution of that city, of that space. And, you know, each one of that contribute to the idea of visual culture in their own right. And they are all valid examples of images. They are all valid examples of, um, you know, what we understand to be image in our mind, um, yet uh, they, you know, focus solely on, you know, a single mode of representation. So the idea is here that, you know, limiting ourselves to a single mode of representing an image um, is probably going to be limiting us in our um, process of inquiry. And so, to make it more fluid, to make it, uh, you know, more dynamic, the idea of uh, image, um, if we can think of an idea of image as a system of interpretation, that how we are, you know, interpreting, how we are um, understanding the evolution of, um, you know, that cultural process or the cultural context of that society, of that image you know, that is possibly going to render more fluidity, uh, you know, a better understanding of the evolving nature of visual culture. So, um, so what is boiling down to is that then if, um, you know, an image or a set of images can form, uh, you know, a system of interpretation, then in the end, um, you know, the question remains then, then is image, uh, you know, a culture. So, you know, is culture and image going to be synonymous with each other? So, is it only through images or a variety of images that we see around us that we, uh, you know, communicate culture? So, um, so then, uh, you know, if we are um, endorsing this idea that images have an intricate relationship with culture. And, um, you know, if we are trying to define what is visual culture, I have a definition here um, for you from uh, Mirzo, if, if you can go back to the text, um, you know, for uh, more information on this. So, uh, what the definition there is that Visual culture is concerned with visual events in which information, meaning, or pleasure is sought by the consumer in an interface with visual technology. Now, this is going to be important for us in our future dialogues and lectures um, because the nature of technology is evolving. And, you know, we are talking about visual culture, history of visual culture, um, you know, from a prehistoric understanding since the Enlightenment movement and the evolution of technology. And by technology, I don't just mean digital technology. Um, I also, uh, you know, uh, mean other forms of technology like print media, uh, etc. Uh, so, you know, the changing nature of visual uh, technology has been important um, in this context. So, by visual technology is meant any form of apparatus designed either to be looked at or to enhance natural vision from oil painting to television and the internet. So, you know, you, you get the whole range of development or evolution of technology here that, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, as, as, as significant as an oil painting um, to television and, uh, you know, the advent of media and the advent of the digital. So, uh, what is interesting here is that, um, you know, the gap between the wealth of visual experience, particularly in postmodern culture, 
And the ability to analyze that observation marks both the opportunity and need for visual culture as a field of study. So, um, you know, there has been some sort of a thirst, some sort of, a, you know, curiosity that is coming out from this development of technology, development of various forms of technology, um, you know, that is, that is making the idea, the area of visual culture, you know, so very interesting um, in current times. So, um, historically, we see that, um, you know, different visual media have been studied independently. And, um, you know, there is now a need to actually converge and bring, you know, all of these together, um, you know, and as critics would point out that, um, you know, in, in disciplines ranging as widely as art history, films, media studies, sociology, um, they have begun to describe the emerging field of visual culture. So, the changing nature of, um, you know, the technology that is the vehicle of visual culture through which the visual culture is being, um, you know, uh, provided, processed, reciprocated, um, you know, that is because that nature is changing, um, you know, and therefore it is important that we need to look at all of that in a convergent form and not looking at them independently. So, um, going from here, um, if we look at um, a brief genealogy of visual culture, if we look at, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, the ways in which visual culture has been understood, has been developed in academic disciplines, um, you know, first we do see that um, visual culture has a genealogy that needs exploring and defining in the modern as well as postmodern period, and this is coming from Foucault's ideas. Um, and for some critics, um, visual culture is simply the history of images handled with a semiotic notion of representation. So, um, while this has been one of the earlier forms to understand visual uh, culture as a history of images, but it is, you know, it, the, the scope is so broad that, um, you know, this definition that we uh, are looking at, um, you know, it creates a body of material, um, you know, that is huge, that is vast, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not feasible at all to do an academic inquiry, just looking at, um, you know, the history of images only to understand the evolution of visual culture. Um, for others, for other um, academicians, uh, it means of creating a sociology of visual culture that will establish a social theory of visuality. So, um, there is another body of knowledge, there's another school of um, theorists who are looking at um, you know, the, the growth of visual culture, but particularly through the lens of sociological um, inquiry um, and towards establishing a social theory of visuality. And this comes from Jenks um, in as early as 1995. And um, this approach um, seems to open up, uh, you know, a charge that visual is given an artificial um, sort of independence that um, has, you know, that that will have some sort of a connection with reality. So, if you can imagine, um, you know, a, a body of knowledge of social theory of visuality, and some of it I was just talking about uh, at the start of this lecture, that, um, you know, that is probably going to give us a framework to look at um, how do we see the, the evolution of visual culture in um, society. And the third um, aspect uh, here is that visual culture is used in a far more active sense, concentrating on determining role of visual culture in the wider culture to which it belongs, challenging place of social interaction and definition in terms of class, gender, sexual and racialized identities. And this is of enormous importance. I will cover this point in more details in a full lecture um, uh, towards the end of this lecture series. Um, 
So when we are looking at a history of visual culture, um, that would highlight these moments um, when the visual is contested, right? We're looking at the histories of class, social class. We're looking at um, histories of gender. Uh, we're looking at histories of sexual and racialized identities. Um, you know, the visual is contested and debated, and it is transformed constantly in that process. So, uh, and that is giving us a place of social, um, you know, dynamism where we are talking of um, how space, for example, and time are def and, and, you know, defining the ideas of class, gender, um, sexual and racial identities. In other words, um, you know, we are looking at the framework of uh, what is commonly understood as intersectionality. So there's a full lecture planned towards the end of this lecture series where I will talk on images and intersectionality um, um, and, and discuss this in more uh, details. Um, and so as you can see that, uh, you know, the interdisciplinary nature of the evol evolution of visual culture, uh, you know, has made the, the disciplinary boundaries so blurry um, that what we are getting at in the end, what we are getting to in the end um, is a body of knowledge that is an amalgamation that is drawn from these various disciplinary areas. But this body of knowledge is also uh, creating a new object of study. This body of knowledge is creating a new understanding of how we understand visual culture. So, um, um, I mean, just to sum up this part that I was talking about, um, is that we are talking about, you know, processes of social and cultural, you know, we are not just talking about, you know, whether we are just looking at an image or a painting or a photograph, but we are looking at an image, painting, photograph with an intention. And we are trying to understand um, in turn, you know, why that image exists. Um, and so images, uh, you know, become a process of socialization in culture also. Um, it is also uh, important for us to note that the evolution of visual cultures have been um, governed by, um, you know, several regulations, several rules, um, academic uh, sort of um, vantage points. And um, we do see that, uh, you know, the, the signifying units, um, you know, such as um, syntax, grammar, etc., to connected discourse, you know, how discourses are shaped. Um, I will talk about the, the relationship between images and discourse um, in one of the lectures. Um, and we do see that, uh, you know, the, the theory guiding behind these, um, you know, discourse of visual media or visual cultures, um, you know, they describe visual grammars, you know, the, we do see that, you know, we, we, we do see a sense of grammar, visual grammar, um, as in through advertising, as in through fashion, through design, visual art, film, television, genres, etc. So, uh, you know, they are heavily rule governed. And we do see the trans institutional and cross media aspects of visual cultures. And it makes it a large site for contested views of identity, power, and control. So, I mean, I was talking about this previously also that, uh, you know, the birth, the evolution of, uh, you know, visual culture has also been an evolution of questions of contested views of identity, power, and control. For example, I will do another lecture. Um, in this series uh, where I will talk about how visual um, images, how images have actually contributed to creation of, um, you know, um, the other, you know, how we understand the other. Um, and, uh, you know, so questions of identity, questions of power, questions of control are, you know, heavily um, orchestrated through uh, the idea of visual culture. So, um, 
just to recap that, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, the emergence of the contemporary wave of visual culture uh, with the emergence, uh, with its emergence in the late 1980s. Um, and then we do see that, uh, you know, the rise of visual forms of communication in postmodern world. So we do see the varied forms of, um, you know, visual uh, form in a postmodern world. So just to be sure that, um, you know, postmodernism, as we all um, understand it to be, um, is not uh, just a visual experience. Of course, a visual experience forms a very distinct critical part of um, uh, postmodernism. Uh, but uh, just to borrow from Arjun Apadurai's uh, definition of postmodernism, uh, who has called it a complex overlapping disjunctive order of postmodernism. So um, the uh, the idea of this uh, you know complexity overlapping idea of disjunctive order um, is also bringing us an idea of fragmented culture, and this fragmented type of culture, as Apadurai would uh, you know believe in, is that it's best imagined and understood visually. So if you're looking at something, possibly that is the best way, that is the most effective way um, that you are understanding postmodernism, just like he, he, uh, you know, he draws an example, just as in the 19th century, um, it was classically represented in the newspaper and the novel. So just like historically, for example, in the 19th century, we see the advent of the newspaper, we see the advent of the novel and, you know, each of these, the newspaper and the novel in their own rights, were vehicles of um, cultural communication. They were vehicles of cultural con constructs. Um, and just like that, with the advent of, uh, you know, transition into postmodern ideas, uh, postmodernism, um, you know, we are, uh, you know, placing a lot of emphasis on the visual. We are placing a lot of emphasis on, uh, you know, visual culture to understand how culture is communicated. So um, we do see that there is a merging of, uh, you know, popular high uh, cultural forms. And, um, you know, there's an entering interest in all things that is uh, visual and there's a growth of interdisciplinarity um, in, in that regard. Um, so now I will, um, go a little bit into talking about um, visual culture uh, and discourse. And um, I will talk about one theoretical um, framework that uh, possibly you would find helpful uh, in talking about uh, the evolution of uh, visual culture and uh, discourse. And uh, so this framework that I would talk about is um, coming from British Cultural uh, Studies um, or Semiology and talks about, uh, you know, visualization as a practice of discourse. So this is, um, this is a framework uh, forwarded by Stuart Hall, who is a Jamaican-born cultural theorist. And uh, according to Hall, you know, culture is discursive. And the way that Hall defines a uh, discourse um, is that it is a group of statements um, which provide a language for talking about, a way for representing a particular kind of knowledge about a topic. And so, you know, what, is, what, what Hall is talking about is that discourses are produced through language and practices. And that has a link with, uh, you know, how we imagine, um, you know, image forms, how we imagine the evolution of visual uh, cultures. So discourses are ways of talking about and acting towards an idea or group or of people. So discourse is a reflection of, um, you know, human behavior in society and not just a reflection. Um, it is also, uh, you know, a praxis oriented approach. It is also, you know, enacted. So, um, you know, the work um, of Stuart Hall in this respect, uh, who has been a pioneer of cultural studies, 
it remains you know extremely relevant in this discussion um, and particularly um, you know what he talks about uh, the role of language in power relations you know he talks about uh, his ideas of encoding and decoding uh, you know and, and the role of language in creating this visual form so what uh, hall talks about is this um, you know framework of knowledge um, that uh, you know you start with in society that you are a product of and then you go into um, you know having your own encoding procedure your own encoding and decoding procedure um, and then that uh, sort of gives rise to a new framework of knowledge, a new relation of production, um, new technical infrastructure. So, if you are interested to read more on this framework, um, you know, please read up Stuart Hall's um, uh, work on culture and advertisement. But what he's really talking about is the idea of representation. That um, you know. Uh, we do see that the semiotics of culture has focused by and large on the question of representation and on the sign as symbolic and by and large it has been highly critical of approaches that recognize the relative degree of motivation between signs and objects. So, uh, we do see that uh, you know representation forms a critical base of um, how we understand um, cultures, uh, how we understand visual cultures. And, um, uh, and finally, just to wrap up, um, you know, in this uh, context, um, you, know, um, you know, how are we actually denoting and connoting, you know, the, the meanings that we attach to um, images. So, you can go back to Stuart Hall's work and, um, you know, check, um, you know, wh what, what is he uh, talking about denotation and, and connotation because, you know, that brings in uh, symbolic meaning to the idea of um, the growth and birth of visual culture. And uh, just to sum up that then, uh, you know, what are the various strategies we are adopting for studying visual cultures? Um, and, uh, you, know, we, you know, we have seen that these are products of, uh, you know, meanings embedded in social institutions that we are studying as much of cultural processes and spectatorship as we are studying images. Um, and then we are actually situating them in the larger networks of institutional context and preconditions. So, um, so just to conclude, um, you know, the evolution of, uh, you know, uh, visual culture, um, I want to leave you with the question that um, in your mind, uh, how do you think, uh, you know, in a digital age that we are living in, um, in the digital visual culture, how does the computer understand an image? You know, would a computer understand an image just the same way as human beings would do? If not, um, why, if yes, why? And then how do we study images in the digital age? So this is a, an idea I want to leave you with um, uh, and close up this lecture. Um, and I hope you find this uh, reflection of these questions helpful. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. 
Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.